All right, we're moving on to our next session featuring Will Reynolds from Hoard Lee. Please don't hesitate to ask questions using the questions tab on your screen. We'll have a brief Q&A session at the end of the presentation. And now I'll turn it over to Lance Walter to introduce our next session. Will Reynolds is a principal software engineer at Hoare Lee. He has more than a decade of technology experience, having held roles as a document controller as well as an application developer. By the way, it's always fun to feel the enthusiasm of the Neo4j practitioner community. And I noticed that Will describes himself in his LinkedIn profile as a graph database addict. So very happy to see that. The grain stack's getting a lot of attention as a way to rapidly build very modern graph powered applications. And so we wanna talk about putting it to work to tackle problems in the real world. We're super excited to have Will Reynolds with us to do that. Welcome to Connections, Will. Thank you, Lance. Um, yeah, and thank you for this opportunity to present to you all. Um, so my class uh, is uh, utilizing the Grandstack, uh, Neo4j, and GraphQL in the real world. So first of all, um, a little bit about me. So my name is Will. I am the principal digital applications developer at Hawley, uh, where I have been for 14 years, um, mostly working in C Sharp and JavaScript, building in-house tools, um, for the applications we use here. But my background um, was actually originally in electronics and digital systems. Okay, the first thing I want to do is I want to just give you a bit of the, the real world context about where we use Grandstack um, within Hawley. So Hawley Design uh, Building Services, uh, we are the UK's largest MEP consultancy. Um, so MEP describes uh, mechanical, electrical, and public health. Uh, so we design the air supply systems to a building, the heating and cooling systems, the water, electrical and drainage, um, all of these systems which make a building habitable really. Um, but as well as that we have a number of specialists too. Um, so they design things like the lighting, uh, acoustics, sustainability, infrastructure and building physics. And we also work in many sectors including residential, workplaces, education, arts, health, care, and science, as well as many others. So these, this is the kind of thing which we produced, which we produced. This is the duct and cable tray networks for a building, as well as other bits and pieces like the piping and the electrical as well. And this is kind of how it looks in real life. Uh, so this is a plant room, and this, it, uh, this shows the services which we might have designed. So in producing these buildings, uh, we generate a huge amount of data. So there's lots and lots of individual files. Um, we also use many different applications and each of these applications is used by a different group. And we, each of these groups have different data requirements. And what tends to happen in terms of throwing data between the various applications is we go via intermediate formats, um, such as Excel um, or GBXML and it tends to cause frequent data duplication and lots of rework and double handling of data between these applications. And this big R you see up here, that represents Autodesk Revit, which you will see a lot of in this presentation. That is the main tool which we use at Hawley in designing our building services. So there's a huge opportunity for improvement in terms of between each group, much of the time is spent fixing things, importing that data, fixing the geometry, fixing the data in there before they can start on the design work. And then they have to look at exporting that data again across the different groups. So, but what we actually want to do, we want our engineers to focus on what they do best, which is design. So if we can cut out all of these stages, they can just continue designing. And once we have that sorted, we can also look at automation. So we have this data available, then we can start using it to generate um, our networks, potentially duct networks automatically. So what if we could communicate building data without boundaries, without all of those intermediate stages? So this kind of, so looking at the data the paths for data exchange. This is kind of how it works at the moment. So we have our various applications and each of these applications store their data in their own uh, file formats or uh, cloud storage. 
Um, so that's the, currently the primary way that building to exchange building geometry. There is a certain amount of interop in this inner ring here. So that's uh, like memory, um, a look for, so sorry, memory data exchange for local history of design. But even in this case, there is still no single source of truth because each application talks to their own data and stores it within their own file format. So how can we fix this? Well, introducing then the building graph which sits in the middle. So this is where, instead of storing data in here, we're gonna store data in here. So this is where the design is. It's a cloud distributed single source of truth for all data. And the data and in terms of and communicating between each application is done via this ground stack or the building graph in the middle. And it also enables what I've called the services ring. So this is direct access to object level data to various other um, services that can perform analytics, AI, IoT, and various other services which can use that data in the web portal or mobile apps. So all of that is unlocked by having this single API from which they can access the data they need. So why GrandStack? Um, so it enables us to go from zero to full stack in potentially seconds. It's uh, based on a GraphQL schema, which is uh, dynamic and very flexible and scalable. So it can capture uh, the semantic building data at any level of detail. And from that, it can automatically generate the create, um, update and delete from the schema without having to build our own boilerplate code. And it also enables control of permissions at field and object level. We did actually consider other DBs as well. Um, so firstly, S SQL, the industry standard for um, SQL, one of the big hitters. So that we found was too rigid really to capture building data. You know, the queries that generated from that were much too complicated. Um, we looked at other NoSQL offerings such as document DBs in, in MongoDB. Um, it's very compelling. It's very easy to throw data in and out because it's mostly based on JSON. Um, but compared to graph databases, there is uh, quite a limited relational ability in those queries. Um, we also use straight Cypher queries, which is really good. Um, but that does couple the DB uh, with the application and the UI layers quite tightly. So then we came to GraphQL and GrandStack. So this was like the wizardry um, that decouples our app logic and our UI layers from the DB. Uh, has amazing query capability. Um, admittedly, um, the mutations can be a bit awkward, um, but that is easily made up by the query capability of uh, GraphQL. So this is kind of how our, we've built up our GraphQL schema. We've actually separated it out into individual files and we've built kind of a type hierarchy. So we have a base element, we have all of our building elements that derive from that, and then we have our system elements which also derive from what, I've, what we've called an abstract element. Um, and in this way, uh, we can have all of these files and each of these files can augment types in other uh, files. So for example, uh, we have our base electrical uh, types, but and a certain application might have additional data which it want wants to add to the electrical types. So it would do that by um, adding their types to an extended electrical GraphQL file, which would extend the types in the base electrical file. So it kind of enables an incremental level of detail as well as a kind of a separation of concerns between our electrical engineers and our mechanical engineers. Because mechanical engineers might want to add some additional data to the electrical sockets, for example, as well. Um, so it kind of enables also an organic evolution of the schema. And this is how we represent electrical systems. So we have a circuit which flows to a panel, which flows to a circuit, which then flows to a socket. And similarly with mechanical and distribution systems, we have a duct network represented like this with a duct which goes through a transition to a duct fitting all the way to the terminal which feeds into the space. And we have all of this data captured within the, uh, the graphical schema. We also looked at capturing uh, geometry data. So we have 
the spaces, and we have the surfaces between the spaces. We have those captured as well. So we have a surface on the wall, we have a surface on the door. And we also looked at IoT. So this could be like the very early stage, and this would be in the occupation stage, potentially, of the building, where we have a space, and we know all of the sensors which are in that space and the types of sensors. So that is useful uh, later on in the, in the life cycle of a building. Uh, and this is our current, how our current implementation looks. So we're using um, Microsoft Azure. This is the progress so far. So we're using the API management service of Azure to direct the requests into Docker containers. Um, these Docker containers are running GrandStack and we store our schema alongside. So requests come in here, and then they come out straight through there. So I'm going to go through some worked examples. So see, these are some specific uh, use cases at Hawley. So what we're going to do, we're going to start, we're going to base it on our main application, which is Revit. We're also going to be using Kafka as a message tree. So we're going to have some spaces in Revit. We're going to pick up those changes on the Kafka stream. Then we're going to create some fan core units. So the fan core units are the things in the ceiling, which blow um, hot or cold air into the room. We're going to update the graph through the graph QL interface. And then the changes will be picked up by Kafka, and then we picked up by, um, sorry, I've got to mention this one here, which is Node Red, um, which is a, a JavaScript, Node.js based uh, visual programming language. So that's going to, for every single fan core unit it created, it's going to create what we call the fused connection unit, which is the power supply for uh, those fan core units. And then it's going to update the graph, and then that chain is going to be picked up by Kafka, and then we're going to actually add the fan core units physically into the model in Revit, and then we're going to update the graph of that data. Okay. So this is the model which we're using, a very simple model. We just have our one, two, three rooms. And this is how it looks in the, in the graph. So we have our three rooms again in our example building. And I'm just going to fast forward to the mutation. And this is the mutation we're going, we're going to send. So we're going to set the space number which is this one here, we're going to set the space cooling strategy to be called by an FCU, and we're going to set the space cooling load. So the logic in Node Red is going to add one fan core unit for every 100 um, load requirement. It happens very quickly once we set up mutation. Let me just fast forward. We're going to change the name as well. So there we go. So very quickly, you can see that it's updated this information and it has added all the fan core units. So that happened um, very quickly, even within a few seconds. And that was that full workflow, which I showed previously. We also has, have an add-in for Revit, which picks up the changes to Kafka and adds these in. So that's the Revit side of things. And it has also updated the graph. So this is how it looks within the database. We have our space, or our spaces, and we have our fan core units in each space. And for each fan core unit, we have a fused connection unit. And we have the electrical flowing into that fused uh, fan core unit. And this is how it looks in Node Red. So this is the Kafka consumer. It picks up the events on the Kafka queue. There's a bit of manipula um, manipulation of the data that comes back, um, finds the spaces um, in the database, and does some more manip um, manipulation, prepares the fan core units, and adds them to the space. And then that chain is then picked up by Revit, and it adds in these fan core units. And very similarly, we also have the one which adds in the um, electrical uh, fuse connection units, and that's the mutation which it sends to add those in. So 
So that's one worked example. We're going to go through another worked example now. So we're going to be using Dynamo. Um, similar to Node Red, this is an Autodesk um, based visual scripting language as well. Um, we're going to be using Rhino, which is another free package, and the and we're going to be using the three D um, the sorry the the uh, an environment for that, which is um, Grasshopper. So let's start from this one first. So we're going to start from a blank database, and we're going to use Dynamo. So just create a building, a project, and we're going to add some levels to that building. And Dynamo is a really useful web application because it enables our engineers to send these queries and manipulate the data without having to learn any code. So we find that it's, it's very useful for engineers to get to grips and make these, develop these systems um, very easily. So here is the GraphQL query and here is the input values. So we're going to create uh, 10 levels and as well as the roof and the ground floor. And these, this is the elevation of those levels. And these nodes here are just about manipulating the JSON data, uh, which we're going to send. And here, are, and here are the nodes which actually do the work in creating this building's uh, project and levels. So when we hit run, here we go, it's complete. Let's just have a look at the database and see what we've got. So we're going to get everything. Well, we're actually going to get the project. So here's the project, project graph. We're going to expand that. We've got our Dynamo Tower, and our Dynamo Tower has all of our levels in it. Here we go. So the GraphQL query has done its work. So then we're going to go on to the next stage then in Rhino, and we're going to take that data again, and we're going to kind of create um, a building. We're going to start from a, some rectangles, and each of these rectangles kind of des describes the perimeter of a space. And we're going to extrude that up for every single level which we defined in the, in the earlier stage. So again, here is the visual scripting language for Rhino, which is Grasshopper. And there we go, it, for every single level we've defined, it has created these red boxes which represent the space. And this is what the uh, this is how the query looks in Grasshopper, very similar to Dynamo and also very similar to Node Red. One well, of various bits and pieces which uh, make it work. And then at the end of it, here we have our database with the levels, and for each level we have our spaces which it created. And we also define the model element, which exists in this gray blob here, which represents the Rhino model. Next stage then. So at this stage, we're going to, for every single space which we created, we, also, we actually added a bit of data for each space, which defines how many sockets we want in that space. So what we're going to do is, for every single space, we are going to add the number of electrical outlets or sockets for every for each space. And we're also going to add a what we we'll call a distribution panel for every single level, and also a distribution panel distribution panel for the entire building. So this one I just did very simply with uh, just a test. So you run this, run this test, and we get something like this. So we have our level again, we have our space, and within our space, we have our sockets. And our sockets have an electrical supply to the distribution panels, which is this one here, which goes all the way back to the distribution panel for the level. And then that goes back to the distribution panel for the entire building. And then if we move back even further and expand everything, we see it has created the electrical supply for the entire building based on um, what and based on the requirements for each space. And then finally, we're going to use Dynamo again, and we're going to use this data to update the information within a Revit model. So we've already built a Revit model in this case. 
I won't go into deep. Looks like this very very peculiar building. Um, but we're going to take the information which we've defined, which we've created in Rhino, and we're going to update the space information with, with that data. So we're going to use Dynamo again. Very similar queries once again, and then we're going to hit play, and we are going to update those spaces. There it was. There we go. So we're going to hit play. And it will update the spaces, the space information, which it already has. Okay, so we're going to use Dynamo to update the space information in Revit. There, it happens really quickly, so I missed it first time. So here it is. So So we hit, so we hit play, and it updates space numbers with the information which we defined originally in the first stage. And what it also does is it adds the information to the, so it also lists out all of the sockets which are required. So it also lists out all the sockets which are required and adds them to the database as well. So we end up with something like this, where for each space we have, so we know that this space it, on this level exists in as a model element in this model, which is our Revit model, and we know that it exists as this element in our Rhino model. So we have that association between these two models, and we know that they exist, that this space is represented in those models. Okay, so I wanted to show you a final example now. And this one is using IoT sensor data. So this is an occupation, kind of a facilities management stage uh, use case. So we have a model here, which is our London office. And we're going to fly into the uh, reception space. And as soon as we go into that space, it does a, a graph a query to find out all of the sensors in that space. And then with that data, it finds the free sensor, it finds all of the data and then lists, then just shows it in a line, line graph. And we have along the bottom here, we have the manipulation for the, the time. So we can have a slider here and we can choose as we move that, it updates the chart. But the most valuable thing is the data we have alongside it. So this is kind of a, a hybrid of Cypher and GraphQL. So the Cypher query gets this data here, and we show that in a panel in our viewer. This viewer itself is actually uh, the for, um, sorry, the Autodesk Forge viewer. So the stage before this is we publish the model to Autodesk Forge, and we also publish the model to the graph database. So that enables, it enables anybody to click on the relationships here, and it highlights all of the duct network which serves uh, this space, which is the reception space. And then we can zoom out and see more information. And also we can highlight the space itself, the geometry of the space in different colors. So the other information that we have is, so, sorry, you can click back and you can go all the way back to the handle unit. So the use case of this is, if you have any issue or you want to inspect the duct network from any space, you can run this query and find the network and potentially identify any issues that, that could be occurring within that network. So as well as duct systems, we have electrical systems. So this is the meeting room and in the meeting room, we have three floor boxes. So if we click on the floor box, it highlights the floor box in the model. And this floor box is fed by this circuit, which is fed by this distribution panel, which is over here. There it is. So if you wanted to isolate this room, you would know that the distribution panel is over there. So you would head over there to switch those floor boxes off so you could do some work uh, to these floor boxes. So, so we have 
as well as electrical data, we have the sensor information. So this is a VAVA unit in the floor. And we have information about the performance of that particular unit. As well as the sensors which are attached to it. And then we can head upstairs now. And this is the duct network to the, the upper level, level two or the mezzanine level. And we have the lighting, sorry, the LTHW, which is the heating and cooling systems. Low and return. And here is the lighting. So we click on the light, light, sorry, click on the lighting type and it highlights all of the lights in the model of that type. Or we can click on an individual light and then we can find out, find that light within the model. So there we go. So here are some, some more reasons why it's great. Um, so in using Brandstack, we're not dependent on any one application. Um, we can encapsulate logic and the design knowledge um, for all to understand and contribute. It's not locked in Excel files, for example. And our individual design logic can be tested and validated and reused across any number of projects. And with that data, we can automate, automate all the things. So the data is open to AI and machine learning, potentially to provide that automation and many more. So what I've talked about is actually mostly within our use, which is kind of this bit here, but we actually have to communicate or we do communicate with the architect and the structural engineer. And so we have to look at how we can do that. Currently we do that um, we do do that through a cloud, sorry, we do do that through Autodesk 360, uh, which is cloud, cloud based. Um, but that is still very much file based because it is a, an, individu an individual model which you are sharing. It's not at the object level just yet. So we're currently looking at ways in which we can do that. So that kind of represents how it is at the moment with our own hosted uh, ground stack server. So we, we're not quite sure how we're going to do that yet, um, but we are working towards how we can solve this problem of transferring data between um, individual company uh, boundaries. So that's the building graph. Uh, how do we plan to develop uh, the concept further? So we're actually facing several challenges, um, mostly around industry adoption. Um, how can we, as an industry, agree potentially on the GraphQL schema? And is it even possible to achieve organic growth in that way? Um, and, and what I've shown today in terms of the building graph is still very much a proof of concept and not a finished project uh, product just yet. And also it requires, for the individual engineers involved, it requires quite a significant shift from file-based workflows. Um, but if we get the user interface or user experience right, um, it, it should flow very naturally and it shouldn't it should propose a much better solution than their current solution. And in terms of ways forward, um, we need to develop more integrations with more applications. So we have Revit and Rhino at the moment, um, but we need to develop more. Um, we also need to look at third party support. So individual calculation services or third party vendors who supply calculation services, we need to figure out how we can support those. And we also need to look at developing it as an Open, open source platform. So Building Graph is currently open source and um, it's available on my GitHub um, repository. Um, but we need to look at how we can further develop that as a, as a platform. Okay, questions? Oh, thank you so much, Will. That was, uh, that was just such a great use case and the visuals are just so beautiful. I mean, I just, I really enjoyed that. I'm sure our audience did as well. Awesome. <laughs> well, we have had several questions from the audience as you were presenting. And I wanna remind everyone, if they do have a question, they can submit it in the questions tab located at the top of their screen. Um, but here's one um, that came up a couple different times. So, so let's get started with that one. And that's um, a question about authentication and, and how do you handle that going from all those different sources? Yeah, so, so currently within Holy we have um, Azure Active Directory. So currently all of our authentication is via that. So we ask Azure AD for our authentication token 
and we pass that token uh, back to the grand stack service and that is and then it will verify that token um so in terms of so currently the platform is quite um insular um but you can you can support any um OAuth system uh, that you want to but yeah oh. currently is oh sorry yeah. So yes. Yeah. So currently, it's just uh, via P PAT, so first um, personal access tokens. Excellent. Thank you. And there's another one, and it is asking about um, the with a schema which is very flexible. And uh, doesn't this cause the same issues with interoperability you are trying to solve? Like, how does that all come together? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a very good point. Um, so, is currently stored in. So yes, yeah, so there is a requirement for some level of control. Um, because it's currently stored in GitHub, uh, I suppose that does solve it to some extent because you can manage the issues and pull requests uh, through that. But I guess it comes down to communication, um, really. Um, so whether using GitHub or an another platform, as long as everybody involved in the project or the procedure knows what's going on and improves, um, improves any changes, and I think it kind of it's kind of managed through that. Great, thank you so much. Um, and it looks like we're we're starting to run close on time. So I want to remind the audience that if their question wasn't answered, they can send an email to webinar at neo4j.com and we'll get them uh, pointed in the right direction. But it looks like we have time for about one more. Um, and this has to do with some of the challenges. And I know you highlighted some of the challenges at the end of your presentation. But it asks about if there are any particular challenges you faced when adopting brand stack, and then what did you do to overcome them? Um, yeah, so one of the things that we did have is we wanted to support um, uh, um, multiple units. So, for example, for a space, if you wanted to get the the area back in meter squared, or if you wanted to get the area back in um, square foot, you could ask for that within the GraphQL query. And we looked at doing that. We, we built our own um, resolvers and we tried to make it work with the current offering from the GraphQL um, package in NPM, but it wasn't uh, possible because we needed some additional metadata. So we ended up um, forking that GraphQL um, JS package and making our own changes so we could access that data, which worked fine um, until the packages were updated, then everything broke. Um, so we're currently, uh, so we've abandoned that idea for now in terms of getting the dynamic units, um, but it's something that we're looking to support or implement um, through other ways. Oh no, I, I always I always feel bad when I hear that something is broke, but I'm glad that you're going to continue to, to work on it and move forward with it as things evolve. Yeah, well, it, it, it was our own, it was our own doing because we, because once, once you extend, once you fork a project, like, like the GraphQL QT library, uh, you pretty much expect it to break when something else, when the, when, it, when the dependent packages are updated. Exactly, it's a trial and error, right? It, exactly, yeah, yeah. Well, Will, I just wanna thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate you being with uh, here with us today. Um, so thank you again for your presentation. That was, that was just so awesome, thank you. No worries, thank you for the opportunity to present. Very good. All right, thank you so much. And for those in the audience, our next session will be starting shortly. So stay tuned and we'll be getting that going here in just a few minutes. Thanks so much.